let's go through this. Revelation is probably the most popular book of the Bible because it's so interesting to us, partly because it's so challenging. For many, the book is so for many, the book is obscure and confusing. In fact, some won't even study it because it seems scary. And I, I think it was the first night we talked about that story about that lady in Oregon. Um, she just assumed that John the Revelator was on mushrooms or LSD when he wrote the book because of all the symbolism that's there. And she said it can't be understood. But we've already seen that the book of Revelation is a book that reveals Jesus Christ to us, right? And we're going to go over that theme again. However, Re Revelation clearly shows us that it's meant to be understood. And we get that in the prologue. I'm sorry, before I get there, a little joke to help us understand. Man's talking to his wife, but all I said was understanding you is like trying to understand the book of Revelation. Any husbands feel like that before? You don't have to raise your hand. It's okay. We already know what you're thinking. <laughs> right. And that's why I don't recommend you saying something like that to your wife. But tonight we have another introduction, like presentation that will help us understand the book of Revelation a little better. There's a lot of action in the first eight verses. Um, especially in the first verse. So tonight we're going to finally open up the Bible and get into the prologue. I have most of the, the scriptures up here, but I hopefully have a Bible with you um, for when we do open it up. Revelation 1, 1 through 8 is the prologue to Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified. What did he do? Signified. signified. I want you to etch that word into your brain. It's a very important word when we're dealing with Revelation. The angel sent and did what? Signified. Signify. Get that word in your brains. So I'm going to have you repeat it one more time. The angel sent and did what? Signified. You need to understand that word. Very important for understanding the book of Revelation. Don't lose sight of that word. We're going to talk about it later. Signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Again, there's a blessing here for he who reads and for those who hear the words of prophecy of this book. The prologue goes on in verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of all the kingdoms, I'm sorry, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Verse 6, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So that is the prologue in Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. All right, so let's look at this a little bit. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. So what is he showing him? Things that, will happen. Things that must shortly take place, right? Uh, so keep in mind that these are events that are going to take place. That means that they haven't taken place yet, at least in John's time, right? Things to take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Again, it's a very important word. So this is how the book was given. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which who gave him? God gave to him. To him is Jesus Christ. So we have God the Father giving him, Jesus Christ, his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his what? His angel to his servant, John. So we have here an order of how the book was given. We have the Father giving it to the Son, the message of Revelation. The Father gives the message to the Son, who gives it to an angel, who gives it to John, who passes it on to the seven churches. Now, I just want to go off on a little tangent here, a little side note, because this is prevalent in this area, and I want you to hear it from the Bible and not from some quacko that teaches you some weird doctrine. There are some who take this verse in 1 Corinthians 11.3...
the supreme God, if you will. There's the Son, and then there's the Holy Spirit, or they might have a different order of the Son and the Holy Spirit, but the Father is always the supreme being or the supreme God, and then the others, the Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are lesser gods, if you will. They'll use that, and they'll use 1 Corinthians 11.3. Let's go there in your Bibles tonight. I want to show you these verses, and then we'll... First Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. Say amen when you're there. Amen. First Corinthians 11, 3. The Bible says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is what? It's Christ. All right. This is very important. The head of every man is who? Christ should be the head of every man. Some people, let me rephrase that. The Bible says that Christ is the head of every man, so that is truth, but some men accept that authority. They accept that claim, and they, they honor that claim, and they welcome that claim, while other men try in their pride to dethrone that claim, which you just can't do, and they end up um, having their own problems, as everybody knows. But the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the what? Man. And the head of Christ is who? Christ. Now, very important we know that the head of every woman, this is con talking about in the context of marriage, right? In other words, the husband is the, is the head of the wife, um, the spiritual leader of the household. That's the way that God set up the, the family. Um, however, I was told at my wedding some good advice, and maybe you guys don't need this advice, but I was told at my wedding, young man, the Bible is very clear. You are the head of your household. God expects you to be the head of your household. But then the gentleman went on, and I wish he would have stopped, but I want you to know that your bride standing next to you is the neck that turns the head. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> Anyways, so in the Bible, they use this verse that the Father gives the message to Jesus, which gives it to the angels, gives it to John, gives it to, to the seven churches. And then they'll also pair that with 1 Corinthians 11.3, and they'll say, see, there's a hierarchy in the Trinity. We have the Father, who's the supreme being, the supreme God, if you will, and then we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit underneath Him, and then we have angels, blah, 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 right? And they'll pair it with this verse and say, see right there that um, the head of Christ is God the Father, right? So... Um, what John is showing us here is how the message got to us and perhaps the functionality of the Trinity. And there's a big difference between functionality and equality, as we're going to look at. Um, it would seem, when we go through the Bible, that there's an economic or relational subordination in the Trinity. You guys understand what I'm talking about? In other words, um, an economic or relational uh, uh, a subordination would mean that they're when, when the Godhead got together, when the, when, when the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus all got together, when they had their counsel about whatever, the whole creation, universe plans, wh whatever, they assigned themselves roles. And so to perform those roles, they give themselves certain authorities or certain functions that they carry out, and the other ones submit to that authority, right? Or that function. Um, and it's not that there's a different level of godness between them. It's just that they have different roles or different functions that they carry out. For instance, who got on the cross and was sacrificed for our sins? Jesus, right? So we would say that Jesus is the one that did that. Did the Father get on the cross and sacrifice for our sins? Did the Holy Spirit do that? No, it was Jesus, right? So Jesus was the one who performed that function, and so he had what he needed. He was in control, if you will, of the Godhead or the, the, the part that pertains to that function. Does that make sense to you? Just like in every family, there might be a man, there might be a woman, and there might be kids, and especially if you have a man, woman, and kids in your family, your kids are just as much human as you are. There's no difference in humanity between me and myself and my two daughters. However, God has given me a different role within the family. Does that make sense? My kids are not to teach me how to live life, although they do, but my job is to teach them how to be women in this case, because I have two young girls, to teach them how to grow up and be productive members of society as women and to teach them how to be daughters of God, right? That is my role, and God has ascribed that to me, but he has not ascribed that to them. It doesn't make them any less human. It just means that we have different roles. Are you with me so far? Okay. So in the Trinity... We see the same thing. Apparently, different members of the Trinity have a different function or roles they perform, and they all submit to each other for the sake of those roles being performed. Does that make sense? So there might be a, a voluntary um, 
subordination for the sake of those roles being accomplished, but that doesn't mean that there's a hierarchy that one part of God, of the Godhead is higher than the other parts. It just means that they have different functions, they have different roles, different responsibilities that they carry out. You see the same model in the church, right? I am the pastor of the church, and in many people's eyes, that means that I am the highest leader of the local church. But in our church, I try not to operate off that structure because I, I, try to, I try to get the picture across that we have elders in the church, and if you will, consider them assistant pastors because they can perform all the functions that I can in the local church, right? And so we have elders, and then we have deacons, and we have board members, and we have church members, and we have visitors, right? We are not going to ask the visitors that come and visit the church on a particular Sabbath to make the matters of bus- to, 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 to make the decisions on the business functions of our church. Why not? That's right. It's not their responsibility, right? They're just as much welcome in this church as everybody else, but they have a different function. And it might come a time where they their function changes. That could happen in this relationship. And in the Trinity, it's the same way. They have different functions. And so they have different responsibilities and different authorities for those functions. But that's all the hierarchy there is in the Trinity. It only pertains to those functions. Does that make sense? And that's why Jesus said in John chapter 10, turn with me there. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Remember, I'm on my side box here. So we will come off this and we'll continue back in Revelation. But this is very important, especially in this area. John chapter 10 and verse 30. John 10 and verse 30. The Bible says, Jesus was talking and he says, I and my father are what? I and my Father are one. In other words, Jesus says there's no difference between me and the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen the works that I do, you've seen the works of the Father. If you see the compassion that I have, you see the compassion of the Father. If you see the love that I have, you see the love that the Father has. Do you see what I'm saying? If you've seen what I've done, then you've seen the Father, right? We are one. We are in harmony. We are togetherness. We are one, right? That doesn't mean one being, but again, it means that we are one in every accord. And then we see the same topic again when we're talking about humility and pertaining to humans, and it gives us an example of how the Trinity operates in Philippians chapter 2. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6. Say amen when you get there. All right. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6. Paul is speaking about the humility of Christ. And he says, I'll, actually, let's start, um, let's, start in verse, let's start in verse 3 just to get some context. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other, esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in who? In Christ Jesus. Who, so who's the who talking about? Talking about Jesus Christ, right? So who, Jesus Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be what? Equal Equal with God. So the inspired scripture tells us that Jesus is what? Equal with God. To who? To the Father. So economically, there is no difference. Ontologically, they are God, and God is God. Whether you're the Father, whether you're the Son, whether you're the Holy Spirit, you are equally God. Does that make sense? Did you have a question, Bob? Yes. Absolutely equal. Let me ask you this. Is it wrong to pray to God? The Holy Spirit's just as much God as the Father and Jesus. Does that answer your question? I mean, we pray to him. We pray. When we pray to Christ, we're still praying to God. We pray to God, we're praying to Christ. Okay. The Holy Spirit is God. 
In other words, let me ask you a question, Bob. No, that's okay. That's all right. That's all right. Let me ask you a question. Is, is Sharna Clough every much, every bit as a Clough as I am? She well, she is, and she took my name. That's what she was, right? That's what she's doing, right? Number two, is she every much as human as I am? God's the same way. Ontologically, there's no difference between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are one in every single aspect. They have different functions. They have different responsibilities, but they are all equally God. They have all equally the attributes of God. In other words, any, any one of the three could create. Any one of the three could, um, you can just name an attribute of God. They're all omnipotent. They're all omniscient. They're all, om well, you know, Jesus, Jesus put aside his omnipresence, but he still has it if he wanted to use it. He just, he laid, he put it aside. But you can't take part of God away from God. Do you understand what I'm saying? If, if they're God, they have all those attributes. And if you were talking to the Holy Spirit, praying to the Holy Spirit, it wouldn't offend God because you're still talking to God. Right, except for, I, right, I don't want you to view it as a pecking order, though. It's, it's functional. It's functional. Of course there is a difference, but mm. it's, it's always with the Holy Spirit that's Well, I don't know about that. Who brings repentance to us? The Holy Spirit, right? What does repentance do? Turns us to who? Amen. To Jesus. So who's more important in that, in that responsibility? Who tells you who Jesus is? Who, who, who teaches you who, who Jesus is? So what I'm saying is that, we yeah, I understand your mindset and what you're saying, especially because when Jesus was asked, you know, show us how to pray, he said, our Father which art in heaven, blah, 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 right? And then we pray in the name of the Son because we're praying in the character of the Son, right? So I understand kind of where you're coming from, but... I'm saying they all have different functions, different responsibilities, and it's our mind that kind of puts them in this order because in our world, because of sin, hierarchy is such an important thing here. But in their world, there is no sin, and hierarchy is not, it, it doesn't exist in God. Again, there's, there's functional subordination for the, the attributes of the roles. For instance, um, there are times you submit to, to, to my direction because functionally it makes more sense for the church, Right? But that doesn't make you less of a leader than me. It doesn't put us on different planes. It just means that there are times where functionally, voluntarily, I'm sorry, there are times where voluntarily you'll submit to my leadership just for the functionality of the church moving forward. And in the Godhead, it's the same way. Does that make sense? Okay. So I saw Tiffany first, and then we'll come to you. Yeah. Um, for instance, spiritual gifts come from who? From the Holy Spirit. So if you're asking for a gift, who are you asking? Who are you praying to? The Holy Spirit, right? What? The Holy Spirit is God. I mean, I, I mean, I do, but that's fine. I'm not always, but yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've said, you know, fill me with your spirit, God. That's, but yeah. Sorry, Candy, do you have something to add here? Jesus, 
Oh, and there for the prayer, it is functional. The bodily person in Jesus' name and the Holy Spirit is the one that goes and takes our messages and he takes the messages back to God and stuff like that. So maybe there is a functional functionality of their office. Yeah, and, and that's a that's a good that's a good thought. It's a good comment. Um, I, I would just maintain the position that no matter how you address God, if you were addressing God with sincerity of heart, whether Jesus, the Holy Spirit, or the Father, they're going to answer because they're all God. It's not, it's not blasphemy to pray to the Holy Spirit is what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, th there could be a, a functionality even in that, you know, a method that they prefer for, for whatever reason. Um, yeah, I'm not, I, I guess I don't have all that information, but all right. So, but the main point here is that we get to the conclusion um, is that, do you know what ontological means? It means your, your makeup, who you are, right? Um, there's no ontological difference between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are God, right? And to be God, you have to have omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotent. And they all have those three, those three characteristics. All right. And so you guys know Isaiah 9, 6, right? Um, hmm? <laughs> so... Behold, uh, unto us shall be a child, and the, the what's that? Uh, and unto us a son is given, and the and and let's just go there. I can't quote it. <laughs> that is part of it, right? I can get to part of it, but I can't get it to flow right. So, Isaiah nine six. <laughs> right. Yeah. Isaiah nine six. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. <laughs> I'm, adding, I'm adding chapters to the Bible. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. There's nothing added here. Isaiah 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Who is this talking about? Christ. It's clearly talking about Christ, right? Because who is the child that is given to us? But the name is Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Do you see that? So to them, names can be trans. They can be fluent, right? They're not. They're not. They're not. I, I should say they're not. The names aren't the most important thing to them, right? The description is not the most important to them. It was given to us so that our minds could wrap around some parts of the concept of the Trinity as much as we can, right? But to them, it's interchangeable. It doesn't matter because they're all God. There's, it's complete fluency in the Trinity, right? And so there is no hierarchy, right? There's functionality. There's different roles that they've given themselves, but even that was all in harmony. Um, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, um, anyways, I give that to you because there's Trinitarians, anti-Trinitarians in this area, and they try to downplay this. They try to say that you have the Father, who is the mightiest, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or they might switch up the order however they want to, uh, but all of it is just confusion because the Bible teaches that um, they, are, they are one. And in fact, if you believe that you have the Father that's up here and the Son that's down here and the Holy Spirit down here and you believe they're all three gods, then you're no longer monotheistic, you're polytheistic. You have multiple gods that you worship, right? But we believe in one God. We're Christians, we believe in one. And Deuteronomy tells us, and those three are one, right? So um, anyways, so um, this verse in Revelation, if they ever try to pull this on you and say, look, here's the hierarchy, you can just say, no, 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 no. John is just describing us the, the order of communication to get revelation to us, right? Okay. That took a little longer than I thought. Sorry about that. Revelation 1, 1a. So, uh, apocalypsis. Apocalypsis means disclosure to reveal. What or who is being revealed? Jesus, right? And then the apocalypse of John is thus an unveiling of Jesus Christ. It's not a book that is designed to scare you. It's not necessarily a book to tell us about the beast or antichrist, the seven last plagues, or even the mark of the beast, right? Those are all elements of revelation. Those are things that we want to study. Those are things that excite us. Those are things that make us curious and probably are things that draw us to the ear, right? But the theme of revelation, the purpose of revelation is to reveal who to us. 
Jesus Christ, because if we don't have Jesus Christ, we have no Antichrist, right? So Jesus is the most important part. It's all about Jesus Christ. And it's for the, um, for the church, it is a book of incredible comfort. So let's move on. I think we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Revelation 117, it says, Do not be afraid. I am the what? First. The first and the last. And this is Jesus talking. And in Revelation 22, 13, the Bible says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, right? The entire book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ. In other words, Revelation opens with Jesus Christ and it ends with Jesus Christ because Jesus is the entire theme of Revelation, right? So to us, it should be a comforting book. It should give us hope. It should not discourage us. Knowing that the book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ, we should remember that our interpretations of Revelation should all focus on who? Christ. On Jesus Christ, not on the daily news or some exciting current event, right? If it doesn't pertain to Jesus, if it doesn't come from Jesus, if it doesn't come from a central theme of Jesus, the love of Jesus, then we can just discard that interpretation. The theme of Revelation is on Jesus Christ, and therefore our interpretations should be concerning Jesus, right? All right, so... Revelation 1, 1b. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. All right? And then the text itself declares that the book is concerned with what? Future events. Future events. 1 through 11, first century events, and 12 through 22, time of the end, leading up to the second coming, right? So at the time that John is writing this book, these things haven't taken place, but they're shortly going to take place, right? And if we look at the chapters, Revelation chapters 1 through 11, we'll see a breakdown of things that have already taken place. And then as we change our focus, 12 through 22, we see things that are going to take place in the time of the end leading up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense to you guys? And I, someone said just the other day, I think it was in this church, that we're living... We're living in the end days of the end days. Is that said here? I think that was said here. Anyways, one of the churches, someone told me that, that we're in the end, the end time of the end days or something like that. The end time of the end time. I thought it was a pretty, pretty clever way of saying it. Anyway, so Revelation shows us where we're at. Now, it's important to understand. I think we already talked about this. It might come up again. My memory is not serving me correctly right now. But um, it's important to understand that Revelation doesn't give us every detail that is going to happen. It doesn't tell us the manner of how things are going to happen, but it does tell us what is going to happen. Does that make sense? So, you know, um, we'll, we'll, we'll focus on that as we go. So this book provides the assurance that no matter what the future brings, God is in control. This book is not given to satisfy our obsessive curiosity of the future. Its primary purpose is to assure us of Jesus Christ's presence with his people through the earth's final events. All right. Purpose of prophecy, John 16, 4. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So what is the purpose of prophecy? Yeah, to, to increase our faith in Jesus, right? All right, so the book of Revelation wasn't meant to be a subject of speculation and sensationalism. It is something that we can figure out. Right, and what is the number one in, the number one rule of interpreting Bible prophecy? Anybody know? Very simple. What's that? Right. The number one rule of interpreting Bible prophecy is that the Bible will interpret itself. Remember that. Keep that in your mind. All right. So Revelation will infor informs us about what will happen at the end of time. However, the book does not show us exactly how everything is going to take place, right? So it tells us what's going to happen, but it doesn't show us how it's going to happen, right? John, and there's no way John could have ever known that someday we'd be sitting in this church talking about this theme, right? But Revelation said that the message will go to the entire world. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so we don't know because we're not told. The timing and manner of the earth's last events are secrets that God has only reserved for himself. Matthew 24, 36, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. Acts 1, 7, and he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons, which the father has put in his own authority. So then studying revelation should make us better, more informed people, but it should not make us weird or crazy. All right, do I need to repeat that in here? 
All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it just because. <laughs> Studying Revelation should make us better, more informed people. It shouldn't make us weird or crazy. Have you ever noticed that a lot of people that are really into Revelation are weird and crazy? Like, so he gets all these fancy ideas, and they get like all these, these weird ideas and, and, and just all these random crazy thoughts in their mind. And they, they, Revelation should not make us like that. It should make us more like Jesus. When we get done with Revelation, we should have hope. We should have faith. We should be able to encourage other people. We should be able to give other people hope. We should have more love for other people. We should be more compassionate. That's what Revelation is about, and is to assure us we should have assurance of future events, knowing that no matter what comes on our way, Jesus is in control, and he's going to see us through and get us into our forever home with him. That's what studying Revelation should be about. It shouldn't be about all the speculation and, and crazical ideas and clipping every single newspaper article that's printed all around the world to support some crazy conspiracy theory that we have. It should make us grounded in Jesus Christ. And those who know Revelation best should be the best Christians. And the reason why they should be the best Christians is because the book itself is the revealing of Jesus Christ. And the more of Jesus we know, by beholding you become changed, the more like him we shall be, right? So understanding Revelation shouldn't make us crazy. It shouldn't make us fanatical. It should make us just like Jesus Christ, unless that fanaticism is a faith that you're willing to die for. All right, so the main purpose of Revelation is to inform God's people and to prepare others for things that are going to come. All right, Revelation 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place, and he sent and what? Signified it by his angel, his servant John. There's a reason why I had you put this in your mind and burn it in here. The word signified is, I'm going to get this one wrong. Sinano, Sinano, something like that. The Greek word, Simano, signify, clarifies the primary meaning to show by signs of symbols, right? So the book of Revelation is signified by the angel. That word means to show by signs and by symbols, right? Now, we talked about inspiration a little bit last time I was here, and you guys know how the inspiration of the Bible works, right? The Holy Spirit inspires men, and then they write um, what they heard. In, in, in the Bible's case, everything that was written, or every book that's in the Bible was, was written by a man. It was the Holy Spirit inspired them. In Revelation, the message itself comes from, from Jesus, not from the Holy Spirit, but um, he's given him signs and symbols, and that means that there is stuff written in this book that the author had no idea what it meant, right? He saw something. He couldn't, he couldn't explain what it was. He just copied it faithfully to what he was told to copy, what he was shown to copy. He put it down, and he passed the message along to us, right? For instance, uh, Revelation 13, it talks about a two-horned beast, right, coming up out of land. Now, as we get to Revelation 13, you're going to see that that's talking about America. The beast is talking about America. What beast is native to, native to, to, to North America and has two horns? A what? A buffalo. John would have never seen a buffalo in his life because they're indigenous to North America, and he was over on an island in Greek. He would have had no idea what a buffalo was. However, he saw the picture, and he wrote it down, and as we look at it today, we're like, oh, that's probably talking about a buffalo. Do you see what I'm saying, right? But it signified to us, and this is the other important piece that I need you to take away, and listen very carefully because I had contention about this at one of my other churches. I don't want contention here. Regardless of what John knew what he was writing or not is irrelevant because Jesus knew what he was writing through John, right? And Jesus can give us the understanding of that symbol. Does that make sense to you? And Jesus wants to give us the understanding of that symbol because the book is to reveal who? Reveal Jesus. And do you think Jesus wants to reveal himself to us? Yes, he died so that he could do that, right? All right, so regardless of what John knows or not is irrelevant because Jesus does, and he's the one who's sending the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth and, 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 and um, understand the symbols. But the, the, the signified, the samano, samino, carries the primary meaning to show by signs or symbols. That's why we call it a prophetic book because there's a lot of symbology in it. All right, and it's talking about future events. So this word is used in the Septuagint when Daniel explained to King Nebuchadnezzar that the metal statue represented what will take place 
in the future, right? It's a message through symbols. Does that make sense? All right. So, moving on. Why didn't God just spell it out for us? You ever ask that question? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Why do you think he didn't do that? He wanted us to get it first. Okay, that's part of it. He wanted us to dig and search, right? What's the other reason why John, I'm sorry, God gave us this book in symbols? Anybody know why? It what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back a little bit on that because Daniel was closed for the time of the end, but Revelation was opened. It's an open book, right? So it's not that it wasn't to be revealed yet, but there is a, an encrypted revelation in there. And part of the reason why is because where is John at when he's writing the book of Revelation? He's on the island of what? And why is he on the island of Patmos? He's being persecuted, right? Persecuted for his religious faith, and the Roman authorities are trying to keep him from proselytizing, right? If he just writes a straightforward message, are the Romans going to let him get this book out? Are they going to let that book come to the Christians and encourage us all through time? Absolutely not. The devil's going to make sure that he inspires them to destroy that book, right? But as they're getting it, the devil didn't even have time to study it as it's coming from John's hand. He didn't even know what it meant, right? And so... <clears throat> He, he knows now, don't get me wrong, but I'm saying at that point when it came from John's hand, he didn't know, right? But I'm just saying this, that that's probably why um, he didn't just spell it out for us, that he put it in signs and symbols so it can get out. Do you guys know why this book was written to the seven churches? I found this information after I shared this topic with you guys. That's why I'm bringing it back up. The seven churches are located in Asia Minor. Right? Asia Minor is the first place where the Christians were for or, or the Christians were, were forced to choose or or found themselves in the situation where they had to decide to, to to worship the Roman emperors or to die. Right? That's where persecution over em Roman emperor worship started, is in the churches of Asia Minor. So you have these churches, these seven churches, that are in the hot spot of some crazy persecution, and you have John who's been exiled, and so Jesus is trying to get a message of comfort and hope to both of them, to all of them, right? And he knows if he just writes it out, the message isn't getting out there, so he puts it in symbols so that when they get the church, when they get these, even if they don't understand it, the message can bring us hope, and it still brings us hope today. Amen? All right, so and as people have been placed, um, I'm sorry, if God would have plainly told the entire story of the great controversy, Satan would have completely wiped out the manuscripts that contained his last day deception. And then, that's a possible theory, and then and as people have been placed in great danger, so these are possible theories. Um, therefore, I think it was wise of God to choose to use symbols. All right. That's a good thought. Who's our decoder? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our decoder, right? As we open up this book, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come and lead us and guide us into all truth. Amen? Yes. Some of the symbols are labeled by John. We see that in Revelation 1, 20, 12, 9, and 17, 5. Not all the symbols have labels on them. So how do we understand them? The Old Testament reality in Revelation. In dealing with the symbols in Revelation, we must keep in mind that the Revelation was written almost 2,000 years ago to the Christians of John's time. Keep in mind that the symbolic language of Revelation is first century. As we study Revelation today, we must determine the meaning of those symbols had for the original recipients, right? So let me give you a very good example of how this works, right? Um, and I'm, I'm not picking on any kind of lifestyle or, or, or anything else. I'm just using a word that commonly comes up. So the word gay. In the 50s, what did that word mean? Happy. Then happy. It has a different connotation with it today, doesn't it? I'll never forget, I was at one of my church elders in Houghton Lake. Uh, Glenn Bernard, he's an elder at Houghton Lake. I was in his shop in his garage. We were getting ready to go snowmobile, and we were putting on some riding clothes. And I didn't have a snowmobile suit. And he said, here, you can use this one. It belonged to my partner. And he handed it to me. And then he looked at me and he said, well, no, not that kind of partner, <laughs> right? Because partner carries a different connotation now than it used to. Do you understand? Words change over time. A fag is a bundle of cigarettes 
or a bundle of sticks in Europe, but over here it has a different connotation. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right. Again, I'm not picking on a specific lifestyle. That's not my point. My point is that it's just to show that there is an etymology of words. There's a changing of, of words. And so as we look at these symbols, we have to keep in mind that over 2,000 years, the definition, what we, can, what we would look at a symbol and say, well, this is what it means, might not be what was the original intent, and we have to try to get back to the original intent. And so we do that by trying to use the Bible, to, or by using the Bible to interpret the Bible, right? All right. So, and how do we do that, Bob? This is something you brought up one time. The That's right. So Revelation has 404 verses. 276 of them are direct quotes from the Old Testament. Therefore, it is important that you understand that the first century readers of Revelation would have understood most of the symbols in light of their Old Testament background, right? Remember the, the first principle of, of interpreting Bible prophecy is what? The Bible, the Bible interprets itself, right? How important that is in Revelation. Two-thirds of the book is directly from the Old Testament. The Bible interprets itself, Right? So we'll get to we'll search the Old Testament for uh, for the background information to understand the symbols, and then in unlocking the meaning of the symbols and images of Revelation, we must first pay attention to the Old Testament. All right. So this is where I want to make a disclaimer, though. All right, and this disclaimer is very simple, and you can repeat after me if you want to, or you can just keep this information for yourself. All right. I am not an expert in Revelation. <laughs> right. I am not an expert. I am studying this out for myself, and I am sharing with you what I am learning and what I am finding, okay? If you disagree with me on something, that's fine. You can disagree with me. I'm the one presenting, so we might get to a situation where we just have to agree to disagree and move on, and that's okay. I am not saying that I am the end-all and the know-it-all of Revelation. I'm not saying that I'm going to simply present to you what makes sense to me, but you might come to a different conclusion, and you can feel free to share that with us. You know, we can go from where we can. You know, maybe through discussion, we'll, we'll come to a better conclusion, or like I said, we might have to agree to disagree, and that's okay, all right? To be a Seventh-day Adventist, we have 28 fundamental beliefs, all right? Seventh-day Adventists are agreed on 28 fundamental beliefs. The book of Revelation and the interpretation of Revelation, for the most part, for the large part, is not one of those fundamental beliefs, all right? So it's possible that we can disagree and both be very faithful Seventh-day Adventists. And more importantly than that, we can disagree and both be very faithful servants of Jesus. And I'm okay with that, all right? But just know I'm going to do my best to show you what it means, and we'll learn together. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. So I say that for a very important reason. Let me get back to where I was. Oh, I don't know how I got so far ahead. All right. So unlocking the meaning of symbols and images of Revelation, we must first pay attention to the Old Testament, right? So... Um, we will do our best to show the meaning of the symbols here, but we may not be able to identify every single one. Now, here's some encouragement to you from a very, a very experienced Christian author. This is from Acts of the Apostles, page 584, 585. Let none think, because they cannot explain the meaning of every symbol in the Revelation, that it is useless for them to search this book in an effort to know the meaning of the truth it contains. The one who revealed these mysteries to John will give to those diligent search will give to the diligent searcher for truth a foretaste of heavenly things. Those whose hearts are open to the reception of truth will be enabled to understand its teachings and will be granted the blessing promised to those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. In the revelation all the books of the Bible meet and end. Here is the complement of the book of Daniel. One is a prophecy. The other is a what? Revelation. Of a revelation. This is a quote for every single one of us in this room, and especially for me. I might not be able to understand everything, but she says that as I study it, I'm going to get some truth, and it's going to be a blessing to me. Right. Amen? We don't have to be discouraged if we can't explain everything because we'll get what the Holy Spirit wants us to get. And possibly the next time we look at it, we'll get a little bit more, and the next time a little bit more until Jesus comes. And maybe we'll study it for all eternity, for all I know. So... <laughs> Gives you a little more time. Gotcha. 
All right, verses 2 and 3. Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is what? The time is near. Continuing on, the Beatitudes of Revelation. The book promises a special blessing to its readers. The Makarios. The Greek word for blessed is makarios. It literally means happy. It means happy. There's a list of beatitudes in Revelation. Now, when I say beatitudes, where does your mind automatically go? To the Sermon on the Mount, right? Blessed are they who are persecuted. Blessed are they who are, uh, are persecuted for righteous sake. Blessed are those who are hunger, for they shall be fed. Blah, 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 right? You guys know the beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. There's beatitudes of Revelation. It's the makarios, the Greek word for blessed. Um, it literally means happy. This is the same word that Jesus used on the Sermon on the Mount. But what we have to understand is that this makarios refers to a deep inner joy that nobody and nothing can take away. And that's why when you understand Revelation, you should be a better Christian. You shouldn't become some weird wacko. You should be more like Jesus Christ because there's a blessing in it, a makarios, that can't be taken away from you. This is the same word used in Romans 4, 7 through 8. Uh, I think we're almost out of time, so I'm going to skip that, but you can look that up later. Uh, we can gather a blessing and a joy on par with the realization of having our sins being forgiven, forgiven by learning revelation. In other words, blessed are he, Romans 4, 7 through 8, the theme of it is blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, right? When you realize that your sins have been forgiven, you have an inner joy. You have an inner peace that nobody can take from you. Why? Because God has given you something greater. He's given you a markarios, a blessing, a joy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't you think they're intertwined? Yes, absolutely they are. Yeah, they're not one and not bigger than the other. And I'm glad you said that because you get the same blessing from understanding the book of Revelation. The same inner joy when it's revealed and it makes sense to you. You get the same inner joy. They're intertwined, just like you said. What's that? Yes, the blessing that the paralytic felt. Yes. Right. The paralytic, the, the the paralytic was blessed because of the 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 not the physical healing, but the spiritual healing. And the only reason why I'm repeating you is because it's being recorded, so that they can hear. It. Yeah. All right. So if you guys hear me repeat what you say, it's just so that they pick it up on the recording. So this type of blessing transcends the hardships of life and carries us above our problems and gives us hope for a future glory where there will be no more suffering. And as we see in Revelation 22, Revelation 22, 7, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. In 22, 14, Blessed, the Makarios, are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. How many of you, when you have the right to enter through the gates of New Jerusalem and you can walk to the tree of life and you can pick that fruit that will ensure that you never age again, what kind of happiness do you think you're going to feel in that moment? Jesus says you can get that same happiness, that same inner joy from studying the book of Revelation. And that's why this church should be absolutely filled right now because we're studying the book of Revelation. And who doesn't have more room for the joy that only Jesus can give? All right. I start preaching sometimes. I apologize. Revelation chapter 1, verses 2 through 3, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. One might notice the change in the text from the one who reads, singular, to those who hear, plural. This suggests a public reading of Revelation in a church setting. The listeners, or those who hear, were the congregation assembled to hear the reading of the book's prophecies. In other words, in, 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 in first century times in the church, there would be somebody who would get up and they would literally read the book of the Bible in front of everybody in a public reading so everybody could hear. 
There was not only a blessing for the one who reads it, but a blessing for the one who hears it. There's not only a blessing for the one who teaches about Revelation, but there's a blessing from those who hear, who are being instructed on the book of Revelation. Amen? Amen. All right. So, Revelation thus envisions in pointed by God to make the prophecies of Revelation understandable to the church. That means the book of Revelation was meant to be studied by the whole body of believers. Now, I don't know if I'm appointed by God to make it understood, but he did put it on my heart to teach a revelation, and I don't know if that's the same thing, but I'm going to do my best, all right? But don't think that I'm like some special prophet, or I'm not. All right, okay. And then, when believers understand the prophecies of revelation and respond by taking these prophecies to heart, a great blessing will come upon them as they come closer to Jesus, which is really the main point of the book of Revelation. All right, I've held you captive for exactly 50 seconds longer than I told you I would. <laughs> so, the important thing is this. As we study through Revelation, we might not figure out every single detail about it, but we're going to figure out enough that we're going to get a blessing from Jesus Christ himself that, as Bob said, is the same as intertwined with the blessing of having our sins forgiven. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, as we learn the book of Revelation, as we study through it, as we, as we painstakingly go through it verse by verse, as we go through it and pick it apart, it may take us a year, it may take us more than a year to get through the whole book. Lord, we do it because we know that there's blessings in it. We do it because we know it reveals you to us. But Lord, don't let it. Just reveal you to us. But we give you permission and we ask you, Lord, that as you reveal yourself to us, that you make us more like you. Amen. That we take it into heart, that we become more loving, we become more compassionate, we become more faithful, we become more obedient. Lord, we do all those things out of the blessing and from the blessing that you give us from being more, or from, from seeing you more fully. Lord, help us to see you more fully. Make revelation plain. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.